Good morning, everyone. This is Nick from the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Welcome to a special edition of Live Virtual Read Aloud coming from Maryland here on Friday, August 28th. We are super excited uh, because we have a very special with us today. His name is Simran Jeet Singh, and he is an amazing uh, writer, advocate, civic leader, all around awesome human being who you all will get to know today, which is really great. And uh, he is the author of a very special new book called Foja Singh Keeps Going. And it's the story of an amazing uh, person who was the oldest person to ever run a marathon. And it's a very special book uh, in many different ways. And, and one of the very important ways is that is the first uh, book published by a major US publisher to feature a Sikh or Sikh, which is the, the, the best way to say that. Sikh. Great. Uh, um, first book published by a major US publisher to feature a Sikh uh, character and uh, story which is super exciting. It's an important, important moment in publishing history, which is super amazing. We're super grateful for Simran's work and for uh, bringing this story to everyone so that we can ensure that everyone feels represented in the books that are available through your local library or through your bookstore. Um, so a bit about Simran before we go into our reading, which is gonna be super awesome. Uh, Simran is a writer, teacher, scholar, and activist. He is a 2020 Equality Fellow with the Open Society Foundation and he hosts two shows, a video web series titled Becoming Less Racist, Lighting the Path to Anti-Racism, and Spirited, an interview-based podcast that explores diverse perspectives on faith and justice. Um, he is also on civic committees with uh, elected a fit. Uh, we bring values of equity to run an anti race to everything that we do in the public sector. So if you're aware the link, wherever you're watching friends, Seen live on Facebook, YouTube, and things over to Simran, who will share his beautiful. And if you have questions at any time, uh, whether you're an adult or whether you're, you're a kid tuning in, please give chat wherever you're watching us from, and we will get those questions during the Q and A. Okie doke. Welcome, Simran. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and um, I will. Pull up the book here and put it to full screen so we have a nice little view. Um, this is called Foja Singh Keeps Going, the true story of the oldest person to ever run a marathon. There's a nice little forward at the beginning and, and maybe if we have time later, I can come back and read it if you'd like. Um, but it's, it's a very nice little message from Foja Singh himself. It was a sweltering summer Little Foja Singh sat under the shade of a banyan tree in his village in Punjab, eating mangoes and watching the other children play. Foja was smart and funny. He and his friends liked to play cards and marbles while sitting in a circle and telling jokes. But Foja longed to join them when they ran and jumped. He longed to play hopscotch, to rescue a runaway cricket ball, or to run with a kite flying high across the sky. He wished he felt as strong as his name, which meant warrior lion. When he was very little, his parents worried that he might never walk. Month after month and year after year went by, but Foja did not take a single step. Aunts and uncles, grandmas and grandpas shook their heads gravely and said, it's too hard, he's too weak. But Foja did not listen and Foja did not stop. Instead, every morning he would listen to his mother who said, you know yourself Foja and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. Foja practiced walking outside his family's hut each day, staying in the mud to soften every fall. He practiced and prayed for months. He could feel himself getting stronger inside and out. Then a few days after Foja's fifth birthday, a wonderful thing happened. He took one step and another, then another and another and another. Foja Singh was finally walking. Foja's parents were proud that their, that their son understood what he was capable of and that he worked hard to achieve his goals. They were thrilled Foja could walk 
because they knew it would make his life easier. His parents were so happy, they shared prayers of thanks and distributed Brashad to the entire village. Once Foja began to walk, his legs needed strengthening. He practiced walking around the banyan tree every day. Some bullies thought his legs looked like sticks, and they teased Foja by calling him Benda. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. Though his legs were weak, his spirit was strong. As Foja got bigger, it was time to go to school. But the school was miles away from his small village. There were no buses. Foja's legs could not carry him all that distance, and they couldn't bring the school to him. So while Foja's friends went to school, he got his education on the farm, learning to plant, plow, and pick all kinds of crops. It's too hard. He's too weak, said the neighbors. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. He'd walk behind the buffaloes, planting seeds and getting stronger with each step. Foja worked and worked and worked. He walked and walked and walked. He farmed and farmed and farmed. And when Foja turned 15, the whole village witnessed a new wonder. Foja could walk an entire mile. Foja progressed by leaps and bounds, and he took many big steps over the next few years. He got married, he had children, and he even got his own farm. Foja loved life in Punjab. He loved flying kites in the open fields with his children. He loved the excitement of a close cricket match played with friends. And he loved the joy that filled the village during the harvest festival of Vesakhi. He taught his children how to farm just like his father had taught him. Every morning, he would tell his children, you know yourselves and what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. He cherished every step in his life's journey. As time passed, Foja's children grew up and moved to places far away. Foja, who was usually lively and energetic, grew sad and lonely, especially after his wife died. He missed his family and wanted to be with them. But to leave his village at the age of 81, to go live on the other side of the world, could Foja do it? His friends were worried. You're too old, Foja, they said. It's too hard for you to move away. But Foja didn't listen and Foja didn't stop. He knew it was time for him to take a step in a new direction. One day, Foja got on an airplane for the first time and went to live with his family in England. It was cold in England and almost everyone only spoke English. Foja was used to having many friends, but here he felt like a stranger. His family was busy with school and work. Foja found himself with nowhere to go and nothing to do. Foja passed his days in the living room staring at the television. He had never been so miserable. As he was flipping channels one day, he saw something new. A whole lot of people were running around town. Was it a fire? An accident? No, Foja realized. They were running just to run, and they all had big smiles on their faces. Foja knew at once that he had to try this. He put on his shoes and then walked out the door. He took one step and another, then another, and another, and another. Foja Singh was running. The wind flowed through his beard, and for the first time in a long while, a smile appeared on his face. After that day, there was no stopping Foja. He began running a little bit every morning. As he got stronger, he ran faster and longer. And when he felt especially strong, he would even run again in the evenings before eating dal and roti with his family. In England, it was common to see people running for fun, but not many of them looked like Foja Singh. Some people would stare and some would laugh, but Foja did not let that bother him. He ran and ran through the streets and parks of England, getting better and better each day. He ran races and he ran for fun. He ran with friends and he ran alone, always with a smile on his face. Foja loved running. He liked the new friends he made, 
He enjoyed exploring the new country he now called home, and he loved how being outdoors reminded him of his childhood, of playing hopscotch and flying kites in the fields. It had been a long time since he felt this happy. More than anything, Foja loved the challenge. He had always enjoyed pushing his limits, whether it was learning to walk, doing farm work, or moving to a new country. Now he was ready for his next challenge. He started training with a coach, Harmander Singh, who had run many marathons and had trained others to run marathons too. There was no looking back after that. Harmander and Foja ran together many times a week. And after months of hard work, 89-year-old Foja Singh became one of the oldest people to ever complete the 26.2-mile London Marathon. Foja ran the London Marathon five more times after that, getting faster each year and setting new records each time. By this point, Foja was famous, as people in England followed this man with a beard, turban, and a disarming smile running great distances, began to learn more about his sick background. Around this time, Foja learned that some people in the United States were attacking six for how they looked. Foja knew this was wrong and he wanted to help, but he wasn't sure how to share his message. He couldn't read, he couldn't write, he couldn't speak English. He could run, and at once Foja knew what he had to do. He decided to run the world's biggest marathon in New York City. By now, Foja was 93 years old. Could he still run 26.2 miles? Many news reporters didn't think so. But Foja did not listen, and Foja did not stop. Every day he practiced with his coach. Every night he dreamed about running. And every morning he reminded himself of his mother's words. You know yourself, Foja, and you know what you're capable of. Today is a chance to do your best. The big race finally came on a chilly November day in 2003. Foja Singh stood at the start line. He felt ready, knowing he had prepared as well as he could. He stretched in anticipation and recited a prayer, envisioning what it would feel like to cross the finish line. Just then, someone shouted racist and hateful words at him. Other people joined in. Foja brushed it off. He knew he had a strong spirit. He ran one foot in front of the other, and then disaster. The tender blisters on the soles of his feet had burst, and he was in a world of pain. He kept going, limping to the finish line. He made it, but it was his slowest time ever. Foja was so exhausted that he collapsed right after the race. Medics wanted to rush him into an ambulance and take him away to recover, but Foja preferred to stay and recover in the company of his trainer and fellow runners. Foja made it back to England, and for the first time in a long while, he was sad. Foja had wanted to run fast and show the world what six could achieve, but he felt like his poor performance at the world's biggest marathon made him look weak and that he had failed his six sisters and brothers all over the world. Maybe they were right, said a voice in his mind. Maybe it is too hard. Maybe you are too weak. The voice made Foja doubt himself for the first time in years, and it tried to convince him to quit running altogether. But Foja did not listen. Inspired by his coach, he set a new goal for himself. He was going to be the first 100-year-old to ever run a full marathon. Foja ran every single day for years. He ran and ran. He practiced and practiced. He trained and trained. And when the day came, he knew he was ready. On October 16, 2011, 100-year-old Foja Singh lined up at the start for the Toronto Waterfront Marathon. He was excited that it felt like an, he was so excited that it felt like an electric current was flowing through his body. He ran along the course and people joined him for a few miles at a time to show their support. He welcomed them with a smile offering jokes to adults and high fives to children. As he ran, Foja thought about all the things people had said he would never do. They said he couldn't walk, 
but he did. They said he couldn't farm, but he did. They thought he was too old to run, and yet here he was running 26.2 miles at the age of 100. Foja had never been more sure of himself. He hoped that children and adults everywhere would see him take on this difficult challenge and persevere with grace, something he'd learned through his faith. It took him eight hours, but he finally did it. Foja Singh finished the Toronto Marathon and set a new world record as the oldest person to ever run a marathon. He stood tall, holding tightly to his medal with a proud smile on his face. He had faced many challenges in his 100 years, but Foja Singh always kept going. That's the end. And at the end of the book, if you have it, uh, you can read a little bit more on Foja Singh as well as many of the records that he set throughout his career. The end. So thank you everyone for chatting with us and, and for watching the, the reading of the book. Um, and I'll turn it back to Nick for the conversation. Sorry, I was on mute. I was having this whole spiel, but thank you Simran for letting me know. Um, so thank you Simran for uh, amazing, amazing reading. It's, uh, it's such an honor for us to hear you read this book uh, as the first reading of it for our library system. And I'm sure we'll be uh, including this book in our story times for many years to come because it is, uh, it is a story that is uh, an inspiration for everyone, and it's an opportunity for all of us to, to to learn about the Sikh community if we're not as familiar. And it's it's a great moment for the Sikh community too, I'm sure. Um, just want to share a couple of the great comments that have come in here on chat, and encourage everyone to send us your questions for Simran. Um, Candice on YouTube says, "Thank you for sharing this inspirational story." Thank you, Candice, for joining us. Uh, Deborah says, really nice story. Thanks for sharing this with my teacher friends, which is an awesome thing to do. That is the way that we're gonna uh, make sure that this story reaches as many educators and librarians and uh, students as possible. Um, and Getting There Five says, that's impressive that he was still participating in marathons at his age, definitely. Um, so Simran, um, can you tell us a bit about how this book came to be a project for you and what uh, inspired you to proceed with doing the work? Yeah, sure. So I mean, the, the short explanation is when I was a kid, um, I would go to bookshelves and look for stories that had characters who looked like me and the people in my family. And I always felt disappointed uh, that, that I would never see anything that, that really did that. And so uh, I promised myself as a kid that when I grew up, if that didn't change, um, then I would write the book by myself. <laughs> and, um, and about four years ago, my, my first child was born, our daughter. Uh, and so I went back to those same bookshelves and started looking for books and realized, you know what, nothing, nothing had changed. Nobody had written a book like this before. So, so that's when I started thinking about, well, that's when I realized it was time to really write a children's book. And for Jessing's story in particular, um, Foja Singh for me was such a big inspiration. Actually, the day he crossed the finish line at the age of 100 in Toronto, um, and the way the day he set that record was the same day I signed up for my first marathon. Oh, wow! So I, yeah, I, I started running uh, because of Foja Singh, uh, and like Foja Singh, I never, I never stopped since. I, I run marathons all the time now, it's become something I really love. You know, it's good for your. It's good for your body, it's good for your mind, it's good for your heart. Um, and so for me, uh, he really changed my life and I wanted to do something uh, to help inspire other people uh, because his story is, is such, a, such an inspiring one. Very cool, thank you for sharing that. Um, the illustrations are really stunning throughout the book. Can you tell us a bit about your collaboration there and um, what the vision was for the illustrations? Yeah, so the artist, um, she's also a, a woman who is of Sikh 
of Sikh practice. She, you know, she belongs to the same religion as Foja Singh and myself. Um, and she's also Punjabi. And that's part of um, Foja Singh's story. And so that was really important to me that um, we find someone who would be able to capture and, and depict um, authentically what Foja Singh's life was like. Um, so that was one, but also the artist that we chose, her name is Baljinder Kaur. I had been following her art for years. Um, I just love everything she does. And so when, um, when my editor asked if I had any suggestions of who I would like to be the illustrator for the book, she was, you know, immediately the, the first name that came to mind. And so, yeah, I'm just, I'm so happy with the illustrations. Um, yeah, they, they really are stunning. And, and if you, if you are a visual person, if you're someone who likes to see stories, uh, as a lot of us do, like you'll you'll love the illustrations here. There, I mean, the the really particular things about culture, the the emotions you can see on everyone's faces, and in the happy moments and in the sad moments. Yeah, it's really beautiful art. Oh, I think you might be. I'm, unmuted. I'm just gonna leave myself unmuted. <laughs> um, <laughs> For anyone who, who didn't turn their head sideways, the last uh, page is a double page like this, and you get to turn the book to see uh, Foja Singh in his moment of triumph, which is really cool. And it's, it, you know, we get so used to like a very specific format of books that when there's a really special moment like that where you get to move your brain out of the box, um, it, it's, a, it's a super nice thing. Um, so we have yeah. a, a couple questions here from Deborah. Uh, first one that we'll put up is um, if you can give us a bit of, uh, your background and where you grew up and where you live now? Yeah, sure. So I am, um, my name is Simranjit Singh. I'm a, a teacher and an activist and a writer. And um, I grew up, I live now in New York City, but I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. And at the time, our family was the only family uh, in all of South Texas who, as part of our religious tradition, uh, Sikhism, we were the only family who had turbans and beards in, in all of South Texas. And so for me, it was, I mean, it was hard enough living in a place where there was nobody who looked like us, but then to go to bookstores or to watch movies and never see someone like us in, in a positive light, that that was always hard. Um, and so, yeah, this this book is, is a dream fulfilled for, for me, but also for our kids who hopefully no longer have to feel uh, so invisible and, and as if their stories don't matter. Awesome. Uh, Deborah also asked, what books do you have coming up next? Oh, I have a, I have a surprise book coming up next. The next book is actually for uh, adults as opposed to children. Uh, the next book um, is thinking about uh, all of our tension in society right now, the frustration and the anger. Um, how do we deal with that in a way that's uh, more positive and productive. And so uh, as somebody who has um, who has dealt with racism and, and has had to figure out uh, how not to internalize hate uh, and to respond with love and to really live in a way where we love our neighbors, that's that's the kind of thing that I think about a lot in my time and that's what my next book is about. Very cool. Um, so in this process of writing Foja Singh's story um, and working with a publisher, have you heard of other authors who are starting to, to reflect six stories in children's literature or, or adult literature? I am. And you know, what's been really rewarding for me, um, I'll say it this way, even when I was a kid, I asked about these stories and people would say they're not, they're not relatable. No, nobody will read them. Nobody will buy them. And, and to me, that made no sense because I'm, I'm just a person <laughs> and to hear someone say that nobody nobody relates to your stories and nobody cares about your stories is, is a way of saying like you don't matter. Uh, and then I started hearing that when I when I was writing my book that like no publisher will will do a story like this because there's no market. That's what they would say. No, no one wants a book like this. No one will see a man who's like this and think, oh, that's a story I need to hear. But for me, that's actually, that, that's exactly the problem that we as a society have decided that there are only certain people that we include or that we think belong. And Ford Singh's story for me is so powerful because he is a hero to us. And, and, in, and in many ways he overturns our assumptions about what a hero is, right? He's, 
he's elderly, he's disabled, he's an immigrant, he's, um, he wears a turban, right? All these things that we, we never see as heroes. So, so to me, part of writing this book was really an act of, it's an act of love, but it's also an act of resistance. And, and so what's, what I think has been really a beautiful part of the experience for me is the, the, the success of the book this week and getting on the bestseller list and, and all that sort of thing. It's really shown people that there is an appetite and a thirst for these stories and that we can relate to stories like this, right? Like it's a story about a man with incredible resilience and perseverance and who does an incredible thing in his life who happens to look a little bit different. And that's, it's not that it shouldn't matter, it's that it does matter and, and we should pay attention. So anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit aside of, um, of what you asked, but, but the point is why, why I feel so passionate about this is exactly the response I've gotten from people who are now um, trying, who are seeing that it's possible to do, to tell stories like this. You know, I, I've been getting many requests within the SIC community that I'm really excited about and uh, happy to support. Uh, but also from other communities where, you know, our community is not the only one who is underrepresented. There are many, um, there are many communities and many stories that we don't tell typically. And so to get messages from all over makes me feel like people get the point of this, that this is not just about me telling a story about a sick man for sick kids. It's a story uh, that's for everyone um, and one that should move everyone and hopefully move the needle towards more equal representation across the board. And yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's giving me a red alert now. <laughs> um, for folks who might have had uh, less experience getting to know the SIC community, can you tell us a bit about where there are large concentrations of the community across the US? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so one of the interesting things about Sikhism is despite being so visibly different, right? Like I stick out in a crowd anywhere I go. Um, so despite being so visible, um, we're also very invisible in this country. People just don't know who we are. And it's, it's such a strange thing because Sikhism is actually the world's fifth largest religion. There are nearly 30 million Sikhs around the world and about half a million here in the United States. Most of the Sikhs uh, in this country live on the two coasts, so in California um, and along the West Coast and in New York and the tri-state of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and, and along the East Coast. And then there are big pockets um, scattered in the big cities all around. But I mean, part of the story here is that six are everywhere and, and there's a massive population in Canada. Uh, there's a massive population in the UK and those figure into Fojessing's story as well. Um, and so, yeah, part of what we're hoping to do here is create some awareness and visibility. I mean, in, in the language of scholarship, as, as an academic, we talk about it as cultural and religious literacy. We just want our kids to know about people of different backgrounds and to see their humanity, right? Like I think for me, as a parent of a two-year-old and a four-year-old, that's what I really think about every day. How do I teach them to see everyone as equally deserving of dignity and respect. And, and hopefully this book helps with that. Cool. Um, we have uh, some wonderful people tuning in from all over the place. A couple here from in our county uh, who have mentioned uh, Candace from Brandywine. Thank you for watching. Uh, Deborah from Upper Marlboro. Thanks for tuning in. And we also have folks tuning in from India, which is amazing. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in at a very different time of day than we are at here uh, on the East Coast in the US. Um, another question that came in was, is there an opportunity for folks to purchase autographed copies of your book yet? Have you arranged that with any bookstores? We are in the process of, uh, of arranging that. And so if you if you follow my feeds, I'll, I'll announce when that's ready. Um, part of the challenge is to get to a, I live in New York City, so to get to a bookstore uh, in the middle of the pandemic to sign copies is a little bit complicated, but we're, we're figuring out a way to do that hopefully this week. Great. Um, and up here on the screen is Simran's website um, where you can go to, to connect with all of his different social media accounts and learn more about his work as well. Um, so expanding our discussion a bit, uh, you do a lot of work around anti-racism and equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, how do you have those conversations with kids um, outside of the context of sharing a book? Or is the book really a great 
starting point to, to begin the conversation using a story as, as the entry point? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And um, so, so the book is very intentionally um, meant to be uh, an opportunity to open up conversations around all sorts of issues, right? So racism is one of them. And, and you know, we just wanted to tell a beautiful story, but part of my worldview is that we don't talk to our kids early enough about the kinds of realities they'll face in the world. And, and we can do it in an age appropriate way, right? We don't have to introduce too complex of ideas early on, but we should also give them more credit um, than, we, than we typically do. Um, and so it was important for me in this book to name racism and to show that Floyd Jessing dealt with racism. And hopefully just naming that will give you an opportunity to talk to your kids about what's it like to be treated fairly. Why did they, why did they, why did they mistreat him? And was that, was that nice? How did that make him feel? Would you do that? How would you feel? Right. Those are really simple questions um, that young kids can, can relate to. And I have those conversations with my own daughters uh, all the time. Um, I think one of the other things about, you know, how to have these conversations that I think about a lot as an educator um, is, you know, I, I mostly teach college students and adults as a professor. Um, and a lot of the times, that's the first time that they're really seriously talking about race and culture and religious difference. And if they're, if you're 18 years old and that's the first time you're doing, I mean, it's too late at that point, right? That's 18 years of hard wiring. Um, that's, that's, that, that then needs to be reversed. And so um, what we really need to do is in education, we call it scaffolding, right? And it's really just, instead of teaching our kids one thing and then let them be adults and then teach them something else and, and, and really messing with their minds, what we really need to do as educators is help help our kids build up to an understanding of reality. And so you start simply and you talk about racism as something that's unfair, something that happens, uh, something that people are concerned about, something that hurts feelings, right? And, and then you can sort of build up from there and make it more complex as they grow up. The other thing that I found really effective um, is to use national moments as opportunities for having these conversations. And again, it doesn't have to be too complex, but on Martin Luther King Day, kids are going to school and talking about Martin Luther King. And so that's an opportunity to talk to your kids about that, right? Um, if your kids are, let's say, seven, I was a big sports fan growing up. Let's say it's you're, they're seven years old and uh, the NBA players decide to uh, to go on strike for racial justice, right? Like that's a moment to talk to your kids about, hey, why do you think they are? What, what's happening here? And again, it doesn't need to get into the details of police brutality and, and the killing uh, of black men or, or, or things like that. But like it's there's a starting point and I think that's critically important for, for parents and educators alike. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, Question just came in, uh, which is, why did you choose to write about running a marathon? Oh, well, I mean, I, as I was just kind of implying in, in the last comment, I'm, I'm a, I love sports. I love running. Uh, it's such a huge part of my identity uh, and what makes me happy. Um, and the same, I have three brothers. We're all, we're all that way. Even as, even as grownups, we spend way too much time thinking about and, and watching sports. Um, Floyd Jessing, as I mentioned earlier, he, he changed my life through running and, and I've gained a lot of life, life lessons through him. And that's really what I wanted to write about, right? There was, I remember this moment, Floyd Jessing was on tour in New York City um, right when my older daughter was born. So about, it must've been four, four years ago or so. Yeah, it was April of 2016. She, I remember that she was, she was a couple months old um, and I took her to meet him. And we sat in the living room where we were, where we were just hanging out for about two hours and he held her in his arms um, and we were just talking about life. And I was trying to learn from him whatever I could. And I remember thinking, I wish, I just wish that she could absorb the wisdom that he's offering now, like the kinds of lessons, right? The, as a parent, I want nothing more than for my kids to be happy, to learn how to find happiness, to be resilient, to learn how to work hard. Right, like all these things are, and, and that's what he did in his life. And so as he was talking, I was like, this is, this is the story for our kids. These are the lessons. He's, he's the right person. He's the inspiration, uh, right? He's got all the values we want our kids to have. And so that's, that's why I chose to write about him. Awesome. 
Um, one of the threads in the book is wellness, of course, and, and sports, as, as we've been discussing. Um, what are some ways that you hope teachers and educators um, and, and adults can um, use the book as a, a tool to get kids thinking about taking care of themselves with, with exercise or with meditation or with yoga or anything like that? Yeah, it's a good question. So for me, one of the real gifts that came out of running that I didn't expect um, was the, the joy of the journey. And I, I think even on the back of the book, we have this phrase, at the finish line, our reward is in every step that carried us there, right? And the point is, the point is, we are so focused on getting to the end that we forget to enjoy the journey. And that's what running really did for me. And, and I'll, I mean, I'll be honest, when I first started running, I didn't like it. <laughs> I, was, I, I knew it was good for my body. I knew it was good for my mind. Um, but it took me several weeks of, of running every day before I enjoyed it. And I think that's true for a lot of us, with a lot of the things we do in life. And so learning to enjoy the things that make us happier, it's not always the easiest place to start. Uh, and so that's that's a really important message that I get through Flo Jessing's story, that, that you persevere through that uh, and eventually you break through into joy, just like he did in many points. And I think part of the lesson there too, just like with fitness and exercise, is that there are ups and downs, right? We, um, we aren't, like nothing is perfect and we aren't always getting there. Um, and so the, the perseverance and the commitment required, I think, is really important. The last thing I'll say is, I think one of the things I find really relatable about Floyd Jessing's story is a lot of the a lot of the sports stories that I learned about and read growing up were about my heroes, my my sports icons, right? Like it was NBA players and soccer players and baseball players, and those people are amazing, but they're really hard to connect with on a personal level in the sense that these are the best of the best in the world. And what we get through Floyd Jessing's story is, you know, he just he just put his shoes on one day and, and wanted to run. He didn't have any major goals of of setting some world record, um, right? He just he just did it because people were happy and he wanted to be happy, uh, and he found happiness and he just kept going. And so I think that to me is a really cool lesson in terms of for all of us that running is a sport and and all of these sports are things that any of us could do at any level and find happiness. We don't have to be the world's best at anything just to be happy. Awesome. Well, um, we're gonna do one last call for questions here if you've got any. Otherwise, I'm gonna kind of start to wrap things up with Simran. Um, what are some ways that uh, educators and librarians can get in touch with you and your team to to engage you in, in having book talks or workshops and the like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you can reach out to me directly um, and that's my full name at gmail.com, Simranjit Singh at gmail.com. Um, I, I would also suggest we, we created an educator's guide, um, which has been released. We haven't fully um, rolled it out in terms of announcing it, but it's available uh, through Penguin Random House. Um, and I, I can try and track that down for you, Nick, and, and send you a link so sure. you can share it. Um, but those, those are also available for you to just use uh, at your own volition if you'd like. Uh, but I'm happy to, I mean, I, I love engaging with um, different audiences, kids, faculty, staff, anything. Um, I find this work really fun and really rewarding because I, I, I think it, it's, it's, the kind of, it's the kind of attention we need to be paying in order to make our, our, our world more just and more equitable. So, so I'm grateful for that question and uh, yeah, happy, happy to connect with anyone who would like to. Awesome. And uh, for folks who have enjoyed this program, uh, who might be not kids, <laughs> uh, we are going to be having Simran back for a workshop on anti-racism uh, later this fall. Uh, so keep an eye on the library's virtual event calendar, and we hope uh, that you can join Simran again. Uh, that's going to be focused uh, on adults, and it's going to be a really great um, opportunity to, to dig deeper into some of these topics with Simran so that we can uh, continue to evaluate and improve our own practices at uh, being anti-racist and, and building a better community uh, wherever we are locally and also nationally and as a global community. Um, here's a question. It's how do your students greet you at first sight? Uh, yeah, it depends on, depends on the student. It depends on 
the context. Um, there have been moments where students don't bat an eye, um, right? Like now I currently teach um, a course for, uh, it's, I teach courses on Buddhist history uh, for mostly practicing Buddhists, monks, nuns, um, ordained priests. Um, and there it's, it's very, um, you know, I, I walk in the room and, and everyone expects to see me there. Um, there have been times where I've taught in other places on other topics where um, students don't expect. I mean, it's it's a good question because I don't look like your typical teacher educator. Um, I don't look like your typical anything in the sense of what you might expect. And so uh, there, are, there are always situations where people are unsure of um, of who I am and why I'm there. Uh, but like for just in the story, right? Like there, there are moments where he gets that and he's learned to brush it off. I think that's what it's come to me. Like, I think when, when you get, when you experience this throughout your life, you have to learn to have uh, inner confidence and to recognize that you belong, even if, even if other people might not see you as not belonging in certain spaces. Cool. Thank you. And we've had two really nice comments uh, come in. One from Amber who says, thank you so much for never stopping. The world is a better place because of your efforts, peace and love. Thank you, Amber. And uh, from Deborah says, thank you both. That was an amazing story and great engaging conversation. I teach languages and culture. So this is a great learning experience for me. Thank you, Deborah, for that. Um, well, right now, as uh, it sounds like some landscapers have activated their, their machines out front of my window, we better wrap before uh, the noise gets too bad. Uh, but thank you, thank you, Simran, on the bottom from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of everyone here at the Prince George's County Memorial Library System for joining us. Um, also would like to give a special shout out to uh, the Anne Arundel County Public Libraries, which have helped cross promote today's event, and to Penguin Random House, which has been a great uh, supporter of libraries and schools during this crazy time of virtual engagement and the pandemic. Um, the libraries would not be anywhere without the support of the publishers right now. Um, and they've all been very generous with allowing us to do live virtual read alouds, which is great. Um, and again, reminder to purchase a copy of Simmons' book if you are interested. Uh, this is going to be my holiday gift to everyone this year that has a kid under the age of 12, which is exciting. And then um, you can also check it out from PGCMLS. We have it available as an ebook now through Overdrive. And if your library does not have the book yet, which is entirely possible because it just came out on Tuesday, um, we encourage you to. Uh, suggest it as a purchase to your library they can get it as a physical book or as an ebook and uh, make it available to your whole community and really libraries depend on hearing from the customers in order to, to make those informed uh, selection uh, decisions so uh, spread the word this is an amazing story that uh, is going to really be a great moment for us to come together and thank you simran and thank you all for tuning in thank you thanks everybody bye, bye.